Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. I'm so delighted to welcome in from all the way up from Montreal, Canada, Severine and Zevi. Uh, thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thanks, John, for having us. This is great. It's a pleasure. Look forward to talking. Fantastic. Well, hey, I, I'd love to have my uh, guests uh, introduce themselves real quickly. So, Severine, let's start with you. Uh, my name is Severine Lepage, and uh, I've lived in Montreal most of my life. I've also lived in the U.S., but I've been a bike activist and militant for about 10 years following my husband's lead. And now I'm a spokesperson for Vélo Fantôme Québec, which is a uh, ghost bikes in Quebec. Um, so, yeah, and I'm part of other militant uh, groups to get things to try infrastructure to change in our city for safer streets. OK, cool. Excellent. Sevi, yeah. I'm uh, Tzvi Levy. Um, I actually work in the transportation profession as a travel demand modeler, but my passion is really streets as public space. And I've been riding a bike pretty much all of my life is uh, my primary mode of interest. I grew up in the States, actually, but I'm from Israel, and I moved to Montreal in 95. And um, I right away, you know, tried to ride win- in, into the winter. And sort of for me, the end of my cycling season was when I fell. <clears throat> but... Um, <laughs> Gradually, like over the years, like the community, the winter community in particular has gotten more supportive and more organized and like, like it's, the bicycle is practical in the winter as well. So like, it's really impressive the amount of people who continue riding year round despite our serious winters here. Yeah. Uh, so you both have a little bit of experience living in the United States. Abzi, where, where were you at? Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York and went to university in Buffalo and Berkeley. So I actually did ride even in the U.S., I, I wouldn't necessarily ride year round, but I mean, I, I, I was familiar with winter and I remember in Buffalo, I definitely rode bike in cold, sometimes snow weather. Yeah. I mean, maybe not every day, but it was, it was, I mean, there weren't a lot of other people around, but it was, I don't know. It's always been my sort of easiest way to get around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Severine, when you were uh, in the States, where were you? Well, I grew up in California when I was a uh, early childhood, and then I finished my high school in, in uh, St. Pete, Florida. But uh, I didn't. I, I rode my bike as a child in California, but I, not much in Florida. There, I, I know the infrastructure has changed recently, but I, I didn't really have a bike then, so uh, it's not too bad. But I just want to point out how uh, beautiful Zvi's pictures are. I mean, he's uh, one of the ones that we get to see on our, our social networks, and he, he captures cycling in Montreal and the joy of cycling really well. So uh, it's a, it's a really a pleasure to see uh, him share his pictures, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Street, street photography is a passion of mine. Yeah, I was going to say, good. yeah. So street photography is one of your passions and we'll make sure that we, uh, we have plenty of links in the show notes so that folks can appreciate and see uh, some of your, your great work that you do. And you, you said you're sort of in the, that industry. What, what is actually, you know, the work that you're doing and the organization you're with? Well, I'm now I'm an independent consultant. For many years, I worked for a software company that made travel demand modeling software, and I would train people to use their product to plan, do transportation planning, essentially. And when I started my career in Israel as a transportation planner, like one of the first things I realized was if you are not in a vehicle, you're basically not in the model. Like you don't matter. And I'm like, well, you know, I ride a bike, you know, but I might have an opinion about whether I like light rail or the metro. And as far as the model was concerned, my opinion didn't matter. So that really bothered me. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and when I moved to Montreal, I fell in love with a Montrealer in Israel and she brought me to Montreal. Yeah. And one of the first things I noticed here was they really have a very special attitude towards the street as public space. Like opening up that space for community uses was a normal thing here. Like we, we, we opened the street for my son's fourth or fifth birthday. Like we had a street party in front of our house and that was like a normal thing to do. So, and, and I didn't, I mean, I sort of knew in the back of my head that this was unusual, but um, it really is unusual. Like the attitude of using streets as public space. And yeah, so and Montreal is like, I don't consider myself a cyclist per se, but I, I appreciate the bicycle is practical for most of my needs. And Montreal is a really great urban scale. So the bicycle is even more practical. <laughs> it's so funny that you, you talked about that, you know, from the modeling perspective and that default towards uh, auto normativity. You know, it's it's just like a, that car brain. And and before we hit the record button, Severine and I were, were talking just about that. It's just like how everything defaults to car brain and uh, and, and motor ve- vehicle language. It, it, it's, it just kind of creeps into our everyday life. Well, I, 
fortunately, at least the models I work with are also public transportation. So you could be in a bus or a metro or light rail, like those were options, but they're still essentially vehicle based. And if you're walking or riding a bike or using bike share or something, like you're, you're literally just left, you're left out of the model. Like it's like your opinions don't matter or you don't, you don't exist for, for, for as far as the decision of the value of the project is concerned. So Severin, the, the work you're doing, I mean, ca- some of this obviously is very, very much a part of what you're trying to counter. Well, it's true because you, yeah, when SV is part of a group with us now called uh, Velo Vision, and we're trying to kind of counter car culture so that actually other people are taking it into account. And uh, and that's what we were saying. It, it, it is so pervasive. Like it, you don't realize that cars dominate everything about the, the space they take in a street, like you say, uh, open, open streets and everything, but it, it's just the, 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 the width of the vehicles and the fact that they're so ever present. Like I said, I haven't always been an avid cyclist, but once I realized how much space a car takes, it just kind of scared me for the sake of my children because I have five children and it just, it just seems so dangerous to have them on the streets and have so much little space given to them. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's so much fun to have more options than some things that are not just cars. So, uh, yeah. 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 Now, the reason I've brought you here today <laughs> is Zvi, you and I you know, had a quick little interaction based on something that was posted about winter cycling. Can you remember what that was all about? I don't remember which city it was, but uh, I shared my photos. I have a very large photo album of winter cycling in Montreal. So, and I've been following this and taking photos of winter cyclists for literally a decade or more. And it's really impressive. Like there's a number of uh, Facebook groups dedicated to cycling issues in Montreal, but the winter cycling community in particular is by far, by far the most active and they're active year round. Like, they, like at some point they, they contemplated changing the name of the group to maybe all season cycling. Right. But it's, it's too big. Well, you're, it's too big actually. Like you're not allowed to change once, like once a group, you know, passes like, I don't know, 5,000 people or something, you cannot change the name. And there's more than 20,000 people in that group. Wow. And it's really interactive. People comment and share in, info all over the time. And there's actually the, the Forum de Vélo d'Hiver, which is this Saturday. And it's it's to attract even more winter cyclists. And there's, like you said, there's it's grown in the past 10 years. You see more and more people. And the bike counters take that into account as well. And I don't know if you, if you listen to, there's a radio show in, in French. Every afternoon, they detail the number of cyclists that passed on the winter, on the paths, just to to, to mention how many cyclists have gone that day, just to counter the fact that it's not just cars that are that are ever present in the city. It's a lot of bikes now, even during winter, regardless of the of the weather. So it's it's actually it's it's growing a lot. It's exponential ever since the rev, I'd say. But even before, well, that. even uh, I would sort of place the beginning actually with Bixie. I yeah. think like Bixie yeah, right. really. I've been I've been riding a winter bike here before it was. I mean, there were other people who did it. Like I'm certainly not like one of the early adopters. But it was still a bit unusual. And um, Bixie like, really sort of shifted perspective. Bixie is our bike sharing system here in Montreal. Right. And um, when it launched, it was really ambitious, actually, like way more than most other cities in North America. Like it really was covered a large portion of the network from the beginning. And it really changed perspectives about who is a cyclist. Like people saw like, oh, I can do that. And like you really had a wide range of people getting involved and it put a sort of a fire under the city to get more proactive in turn in adding better cycling infrastructure. So it brought a lot, like the city understood that it's not just these like extremists on bikes. It's like really everyone. And it's an important resource. And, and also how we use space. Like the big C stations were actually in the street. They removed car parking for these bike parking things. And that as well was like really revolutionary to actually put bike parking in the street. Um, now, if only we could find a way to keep it in the winter. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, well, they're trying. Uh, I mean, there's, there's sure. some stations they stay, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I linger on this particular slide here it, because it sort of speaks to uh, something that you Zvi, uh, mentioned very, very uh, quickly it, by saying, I don't identify myself as a cyclist. Because it gets us kind of into that language, too, of of cyclists versus non-cyclists and, and cycling and, and all this sort of stuff. And it's one of the reasons why 
as we see more and more mobility modes of uh, being able to take advantage of quote unquote the cycle network it starts to we start to realize that uh, active mobility and mobility is a little bit more agnostic to the, the the type of machine that you're on as well as identifying as a as a cyclist and the and sometimes the baggage that comes along with being called a cyclist it, you know the dutch don't think about that i mean there's there's they're just like, oh yeah, we, we just, we ride bikes, you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's just a mode of transportation or, you know, uh, Chris and Melissa uh, Bruntlett, you know, re, Chris loves to just say it's pedestrian plus I'm just moving at a slightly faster speed than I, and more practical speed than if I'm walking. And so I just wanted to highlight that because you did highlight it in this very first slide of, you know, being able to, to, to point out that what we're talking about here is not just sport and leisure. Uh, this is just a mode of getting around, a practical mode of getting around if the infrastructure is there and then we'll, we'll talk about this too, because I know this is a sub theme, especially with winter. If the infrastructure is there and there's that layer of maintenance and management of that infrastructure so that you can actually use it. Exactly. Yeah, it's true. And, and you do see a lot more families like uh, this V's picture. It, it seems so much more common now with the cargo bikes and the long tails and in winter, all, all throughout winter now, it's, uh, it's so much more fun to see this being normalized. You're right. Yeah. And here it is. Boom. In the early yeah. days, <laughs> there have always been people who rode year round, but it, it can be a challenge if uh, if it's just really, really difficult. Now, I, I'm in Austin right now, so I'm in Texas. Uh, I don't get very much of this <laughs> when we get this. It's a problem, a big problem, because we're not ready for it. But I have lived uh, in Chicago. I've lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I've lived and ridden my bike for utilitarian purposes through this type of weather. Talk a little bit about that evolution that has happened um, there in Montreal with regards to this fact that there are people who want to ride year round. But in the early days, it was it was rough. Yeah, so here, I, the, both of these pictures, I used to uh, work at the University of Montreal as a researcher, and um, there is actually a metro station there, but the university is up on a mountain, and it's actually quite high. And despite having public transportation options, like the bike was just so much easier for me to get there. Right. So I would ride up, and it was up a hill the whole way. So I would ride there, and I wasn't the only one. <laughs> so these are people, and um, I actually would ride in this corridor be before there was a bike path there, and there were a few other people who did it. And then at some point, the city built like a pretty wide bi-directional bike path, which really changed. It was a game changer for the kind of people who were riding to the university and, and beyond. But it wasn't being maintained in the winter. So it was like, yes, you have this bike path, which actually it was, it was sort of problematic because it was bi-directional and I tended to avoid it. But anyway... But it, it was like really frustrating though that it was there and it wasn't being maintained in the winter. So, but that, that's that still actually, an issue. It, 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 it is. But this, the and this is what it looked like. Yeah. Like this, yeah, exactly. the bike lane became like a snow dump. Yeah. And um, so there were actually this was bothering like a number of people, and it you know got them so motivated that they actually literally took the shovels into their own hands and sort of made, made a sort of a symbolic statement in front of the town hall when a, when a city council meeting was going on that, you know, you have this brand new cycle path and like, if you don't maintain it, we'll maintain it sort of. And, you know, we invited the media to be there and um, it got a lot of attention and the city did start maintaining that, that particular cycle path in the winter. Yeah. And it, that really did bring like it was it was impressive, like the amount of people who would ride bikes in that corridor. Like when when I was doing it, we were we were not many. But like once a psychopath came, like there were a lot of people who were riding. There's a few um, Sejeps and schools along there as well. Like there were a lot more people and a wider range of people who were riding there. So, Severine, you and I were talking before we hit the, the, the record button about the the different kind of levels of of 
I don't want to say leadership, but it includes leadership. The things that have to, you know, be in place to be able to see transformation in cities. And so, yes, the leadership at the very, very top, uh, including city government, provincial government, state government, all the way up to federal government, but then pushing down into city administration, down to advocacy organizations and people, you know, coming together to do things. But then in between advocacy and just the community is activists and militant groups and people who are willing to grab shovels and just take it into their own hands and invite the news to come out. Talk a little bit about that, because that's one of the things that you self-identified with is that you're very active and involved with militant groups. Talk a little bit about that and also talk about the 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 cultural use of that word uh, of militant groups, because it kind of like, oh, gosh, well, what is this? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it has a different connotation in the U.S., but here, it, it, I don't know, it sounds very positive. And, and there was actually in the 70s, there was a militant group that led to the creation of our bike pass. And it was called Le Monde des Bicyclettes, which was led by Claire Morissette and, and Bob Silverman. And he even coined the term bike shivik. So, um, and, and they would build their own bike paths over the night when they, they, they thought that there weren't any. So it's very similar to the ones who, the people who took their shovels. But um, uh, I, I'm part of militant groups because my, my husband, like I said, he's the spokesperson for our neighborhood group. But what I've seen is in, in many boroughs, and Zvi is part of the one in his, in his neighborhood as well, uh, neighborhoods have created local mobility action, active mobility groups, just to ask for infrastructure where there is none. And we're very lucky in my neighborhood, which is Enhansic, because we've gotten very cool cycle paths that are connected and very used. But we've uh, we discuss with our local elected officials. We have conversations. We sit on panels. We we write briefs, and now we organize uh, activities that are fun and just to get people in the neighborhood involved, like a cycle, a cycla where we asked people to pay into bike pass because that would just be more uh, fun. And we figured if people take ownership of the streets, going back to the street as public space, like Zvi was saying, then you're going to want to keep using that space for fun activities, which have to do with, you know, interacting and social and physical, physical bonuses. So like I'm part of that group. I'm part of Video Phantom, which uh, installs the, the ghost bikes when cyclists have died because of a collision. And, uh, and I'm also, like I said, part of uh, Vélorussion, which is the Monde de Bicyclette 2.0. And uh, we're trying to do fun stuff, fun activities to just get the, the conversation started about the, the appropriation of uh, uh, car space versus human space. And there's been a really cool study uh, conducted by Polytechnique uh, Mont Montreal when they, they measured the space that cars take up in our city. And it's 78% of the, the space in our city is for cars alone. And there's 1.3 for bike paths and like about, I don't know, 2% for public transport. So it's a huge amount on vehicles and and things that are not human. And whereas when you're on a bike, you get to see somebody, you, you cross them at the light, you say hi, you say, oh, you've got a flat or maybe can you give me a hand? Where are you going? There's a critical mass happening this Friday. You can talk to people when you, you can't do. So that's basically what the community, it's all interconnected to, to be part of your city and your neighborhood, really. So Yeah. It's, it's really very, very interesting too. And oh, by the way, here, here we go. Here, here's that Bixie. Here, here's the, here, here's one of the, the Bixie stations that stays open, uh, the winter Bixie. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating too. And, and I want to point out that we, we sort of hold upon high the, the Dutch system and, and where they're at and, uh, and, and the, the success that's happened in Copenhagen and, and several other locations. And for good reason. I mean, the, the numbers uh, that they are putting up are just extraordinary. And the integration of riding a bike for utilitarian purposes is second nature there. We mentioned it earlier. They don't identify as a, as a cyclist. They just ride the bike. But it's worth pointing out that five decades ago, you know, they went through the battles. They had the militant groups, the activists that had to fight for this. They're just a few decades ahead of us. Uh, here in North America, arguably Montreal is the farthest ahead in terms of, you know, making progress. I'm sure that doesn't, you know, you're like, big wow, we've got lots to do yet. <laughs> but you, you really are. I mean, it's amazing, you know, how far along um, Montreal is. And so I like to point, I like to point up your direction and say, hey, if you're looking for a North American example, make sure if you haven't been there, make sure you get there. 
and pick your season. <laughs> if you want to see examples of what it's like to do it right in, in the winter, you know, hey, they'll, they'll walk you along. They'll show you the good, the bad and the ugly, you know, the stuff that is working well and the stuff that still needs work. Or if you want, you know, summertime, get up there. I mean, it's a freaking party up there. <laughs> so. But it's interesting that you mentioned that we have so much to do because that's why the critical masses have uh, taken up again. They, they started again last year and there's one every last Friday of every month because people find we still have so much uh, that needs to be done. We, we're, we're far from the, the objectives that we want where everybody can choose their, their mode of transportation re, depending on what's the most feasible and, and the most practical. Yeah, I, I would say this. Let's let's put a pen in critical mass because I want to talk about critical mass by itself. But to follow up on the whole reason why we're talking winter cycling, uh, and this was as V's, you know, you, this was your, I keep saying Zvi. Zevi or Zvi? It's V. It's V. It's V. Yes. There we go. But I don't, I don't, I'm used to not correcting people. So. This, this is the whole point of what are that interaction that you were having was uh, the fact that there is these groups, these uh, events and these things that are happening. Uh, because one of the things that I like to point out from an active town's perspective, when we, th when we talk about this in, in this language of creating, building uh, activity assets, building the hardware, getting the infrastructure done, that's just step one. It's got to be safe. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be inviting. But the second step is the software bringing, you know, the, that hardware to life. And that's where the policies come in. That's where the procedures are in place. That's where events and activation must take place and the social support networks. Talk a little bit about this, uh, in, in terms of, of how you all are coming together to support each other in the winter time to remain active, keep riding. Well, first of all, I, I think it's really important to emphasize that I think people like Montreal is really leaps and bounds ahead of other cities in North America in terms of the number of people and the type of people who ride bikes. Right. But it's not because of our infrastructure. It's really to some degree in spite of it. It's really the urban scale of the city. And like we have a very mid scale density over huge parts of the city. So it's like walking, cycling and public transportation are valuable ways of getting around here. And they have been, the, you know, the city actually is, still trying to change that to make it easier to drive cars. But um, but I think that's really the reason why so many people use active transportation here. And even in the winter, like it's surprising, like, we, yes, we have serious winters, but like when you're outside, people still walk, people still ride bikes and they still like, we have actually festivals outside in the winter. Like our, our we have, a, it's called a Montréal en Lumière, like a light festival that's just beginning tonight. It's like a three week period of outdoor events, like outdoors in the winter. And um, so this is pretty common here. This in this photo, um, for a few years, Velo Quebec is sort of like our our provincial uh, bicycle organization. Like the they've been institutionalized. They actually began at the same time as Le Monde de Bicyclette, and Le Monde de Bicyclette was more militant and more. They and and also I think it's important. Le Monde de Bicyclette really wanted to change the world. Like they saw the bicycle as a way as a tool to for enacting social change. Like it wasn't just about cycling. It was like really about changing the world. Um, so anyway, Le, uh, Velo Quebec has been like focused on cycling issues and they have an annual um, event riding around the island of Montreal, which has been a really big thing and very successful. And as the winter cycling increased, they, they did a few winter events as well. So this photo I think was from the first event where as it happened, it was like minus 30 that day. Like it was incredibly cold. Like the first two years that they did it, it was, it was insanely cold. And, uh, and that's my minus 30 Celsius, not Fahrenheit yeah. folks. <laughs> well, they're, they're pretty close to the same amount. Like it's well below zero. Like in my photo album, I call it, I call it sub-zero cycling and it really was. <laughs> cycling. Yeah. You have to have some leg warmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normally like I would probably, and, and when it's that cold, it's actually clear, bright, sunny skies actually. And, and it's so cold that the, even the ice, sort of can't form like it's not slippery it's like granular because it's so and this is the second year I, I, I remember and like there were kids who came and it was really like like literally you cannot have any exposed 
surface on on your body. It's it's that cold. But you're but you're moving, and 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 it creates that you create a little bit of warmth on that. And uh, I had the same conversation with uh, Pekka uh, Tacola uh, from Olu Fendlin. And he's like, oh, yeah, we, we, if, if you've got the infrastructure and if you maintain the infrastructure well, people will continue to ride. Yes, it's it's bitter cold. But guess what? You know, in their city, you know, 70 percent of the kids arrive to school by bike. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's it's you have to be careful. Actually, it, it, as you said, it is very easy to warm up, but you can get too hot as well. Can you go back to the previous picture? So that was uh, this is the th- I think the third or fourth edition of the thing. This is the year that Clarence was there, and it was in the ev- it was in the evening, and it was like integrated with our Igloo Fest, and there and it was actually quite a bit warmer, even though Clarence said it was freezing, <laughs> but it was it was much warmer. Than wait, the a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys had an Igloo Fest? Yeah, yeah. We have an Igloo Fest, which is an outdoor dance rave party in the old port, and like in this particular ride, there were probably over a thousand people who rode to this and during this thing. And as you can see, like all kinds, there were people with kids and like the theme was like really, it was part of the, also the month, the light festival. So it was like really about bringing light to the city. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun. It was like, from, from my perspective, it was actually a pretty warm evening. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's all relative when to get cold. But see, like, Vélo Québec organized this, but now uh, other groups and other, like, Vélo Lucien or in the, we, we had one in December, the Vélo Ho Ho Ho. I think you, you pulled that picture earlier where we were in uh, at Place des Arts and there was a bunch of cyclists and they decorated their bikes and we rode around the city with decorated bikes just to, you know, to bring light into the city and to say, hey, you can cycle anytime. So it, it's the same. This this is all come comes from these events that were organized and it's made babies like, but it's a... <laughs> It's just, it's, it's like so much fun to ride it when, when you're all lit up and, and it's, it's dark out and then you, it's, it's better than being a Christmas tree. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I don't mean to be cavalier about uh, riding in cold weather, riding in bad weather. I had the same uh, conversation recently with uh, some some of my Dutch audience about uh, the fact that you do have to use some common sense, uh, you know, there when the winds are, are blowing people over, you know. So, I mean, yes, <laughs> don't do dangerous activities. If it's that cold that your, your skin's going to freeze on contact, uh, you know, take appropriate measures. But my real message here is that we can actually handle much more than we think we can. And when we have the support of a, of a community to do some fun events and to have like the Facebook groups that, you know, give that social support network propping us up, we, you know, we can surprise ourselves frequently and, and realize, Oh, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. You know, originally I didn't think I would ever ride in the winter time. And it's like, Oh yeah, no. I mean, now that I've done it a few times, piece of cake. Originally, I would think, oh my gosh, I'm not going to ride in a rainstorm. It's like, oh, I'm not made of sugar. I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not dissolving. <laughs> so. But that's exactly it. And, and see what, what we see happening now is people are organizing uh, workshops to teach people how to ride winter bikes and, and how to ride in winter. So you get prepared and they actually have people, you can have a, like a sponsor. So you can try it out with someone. And once you do it with someone, you see it's, it's, it's easy to do. You're like, oh, I can take this on myself. And, uh, and there's a new thing that happened in my barrow in another one is the, the, the city, the, our, well, the elected officials for our borough gave out uh, money to people to equip them, their bikes for winter. So it's like, a, a, what's the word in the subvention, Zivi? Uh, it's a- Subsidy? Like they subsidy. It's sub- it, yeah, it, it's subsidy, $200 in bike equipment so that you can get your bike ready to to to, to bike if you want to during the winter. So, so this was a new thing and it's it's such a great thing. And, and then they organize a bike ride to get people to try it out to, with them. So it and was a lot of fun. Severin, yeah. do, you, yeah. do you recognize the photo here? Which photo is this one? Where Where is that? It's, it's Parka Hansik. It's actually, they also, oh. or bro, they also had a program in the park with the, where they would rent out wake winter bikes and stuff let people try them out in the park i didn't know this one this is cool this is my new so. <laughs> <laughs> really cool <laughs> yeah well and that's i think that's so important too i mean what you're really talking about here are programs that help to incentivize and 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 give a little subsidy to trying something different. And we, you know, obviously that's the, all the news right now at a global level of institutions and organizations and, and governments trying to subsidize the transformation over to electric vehicles. And it's like, Hey, what about us? <laughs> Help us out to you know get more people riding more often. 
Yeah, and that's something we have. I have a problem with because they they subsidize electric cars, like you say, but there's nothing for electric bikes or bikes in general. And we're we're just imagining uh, this is something our group is trying to figure out. If people that come to immigrate to Canada were given like a bike once they land, and you say, "Here, welcome to Canada. Please feel welcomed. Here are the bike paths. Here's a bike. Feel comfortable. You won't need a car. We're going to assist you." This would be a great program. You know, it's just a better way to, like you say, incentivize it. So. Well, there are actually groups that do work specifically with new immigrants to Canada. And one of the things that I find quite fascinating with the winter cycling community is it actually is a lot of new arrivals. Like there are a lot of women involved and a lot of new arrivals from not necessarily cold countries that people quite quickly, they see that cycling is easy and practical here. And a lot of people don't want to stop just because of it's the winter. So like there's a lot of South Americans who do it, fewer Maghrebin, and I mean, and there's cultural issues as well about riding a bike. Like certain cultures, owning a car is a status symbol. So like when they've arrived in Canada, like from their point of view, they've made it. So they would not be seen riding a bike. Like that would be like, an, you know, an, an, like, so it's, it's interesting the dynamic around how cycling is perceived in different communities, but the winter cycling community is, is really diverse. It's really, but like, it's another good point you bring to the, uh, the, the, there weren't a lot of, uh, women from, uh, Maghreb that were cycling, but there's a program with Vélo Québec called Tout à Vélo, which is women teaching women how to cycle. So that, and, and it, I know in my neighborhood, we have it too. And it's, it's done, it's really, really impressive what it's done for women. And one woman has said, I've discovered my freedom here that I would never have had in my country. And now I can ride my bike. I can go anywhere I want. It's just amazing. So, I mean, that's a, that's really cool. And that's also part of the car, uh, the, the bike culture that we have here. That's really, really cool program. So we're, we're here lingering at the critical mass uh, ride, uh, one of the critical mass rides uh, that happened in the wintertime. Let's go ahead and, and dive a little bit deeper into, into critical mass and talk a little bit about what critical mass is, because I'm sure some of the, the viewers and listeners are, are going to be like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> Do you want to go with me? <laughs> sure. I actually lived in the Bay Area back in the early years of critical mass when they were being done in San Francisco. Like the idea is basically that you have a critical mass of cyclists who take up the whole street space and basically show that we, you know, we, we are enough people that we, we deserve to have the space that we need. And they would ride in San Francisco. They would ride around during rush hour, which in rush hour already is crazy. And they would like totally cause like in- incredible traffic, hit, like chaos. And it was like very provocative. Um, in Montreal, it's been much more tame. They sort of go sort of, it's Friday afternoon, the last Friday of the month. And they go sort of after the rush hour downtown is already finished. So it's fairly, they don't really do a lot of disruption. It's more of a festive sort of thing where you just go and enjoy the space. There's music. And, yeah, there's music and people like ride around together. And um, anyway, the events have been sort of, there've been a few, like there were even a few party themed events like in the last few years, but um, they sort of stopped because the city seemed to be being sufficiently proactive in terms of responding to cyclist needs. But now like there's actually, despite having a very well, seemingly pro bicycle administration, like people are, are still frustrated that things are not changing fast enough. And um, so they've been now, like they've, they've come back basically every single month. Even in the winter, the photo you have there is from last, just last month. So we were actually surprised that it turned out to be perfect weather. It was snowing and the temperature was really just a bit below freezing. And we had uh, probably 100 people or so. And we were surprised at how many turned up for that event. Yeah. So here's, yeah, speaking to the infrastructure, it is getting better, but we, we, need more, we need much more of this. This is actually on a main street and it's you know, one lane, one direction. It's sufficiently wide for passing. Um, but we need a lot more of this. We need it everywhere. Like our slogan is basically bike lanes everywhere. <laughs> so, Severine, why don't you go ahead and, and address the uh, the other thing that was mentioned there, which is getting more women uh, riding and also being part of this movement, because it's it's just so frustrating how white and how male, <laughs> you know, the movements have been in North America over the decades. Yeah. Well, like, you mean you want me to talk about the program that exists for women? 
Well, or, or just, just in general, I mean, it, we've got a wonderful, you know, photo here of, uh, you know, somebody enjoying good infrastructure. So it, it doesn't need to be that program in particular, but just the, the fact of, of the fact that uh, getting more and more women engaged in, and, you know, feeling like, hey, I've got infrastructure that's truly safe and inviting. I'm going to be able to do this, but also uh, being part of the movement, too. Can, can I just jump in for a sec? Please um, do. Last night, um, we had a meeting of our sort of the umbrella group for the the various uh, active mobility coalitions. And we the invited representative was the woman who's sort of responsible for cycling infrastructure at the city. Like she was invited to come and talk to us and um, respond to questions. And she remarked in with with reason that like it's basically her and a bunch of women, middle aged white women. What no excuse middle aged white men around the table. <laughs> no no no. Unfortunately, there were not a lot of women present, and uh, and it's true. Like um, I. I yeah, it's it's hard to get women involved. I mean, one of the reasons I'm the spokesperson, one of the there's two of us spokespeople for Viru Quebec, is because they, they there was an active decision to try and and portray the fact that it's not just men that white men that can ride bikes because it is off putting for women who are afraid to ride bikes and you say, oh, you have to be really, you have to be a cowboy, you have to be careful. But like, I like the fact that you have this picture up here to talk about the infrastructure because the rev is something that has pulled in a lot of women, making them feel safe because it's wide, it's large, you're not afraid to fall. Uh, there's most of the time it's lit up. And I guess it depends on the, the area where you're, you're riding your bike in the city, but it, it's just so much safer. I'm never afraid if I'm riding my bike with my kids that I'm going to slip and fall and get uh, crushed by a car with infrastructure like the Rev on painted bike paths. It's just not the same thing. So when once we're going to have more of these things, more of these bike paths, and it's supposed to be an integrated network, I think there's going to be even more women that are going to find it more comfortable and just easier. It's just like you said, we want it to, to be a Dutch way of thing. It's not, you, you ride your bike because it's uh, the most practical thing to do, not because it's it, it should, you shouldn't have to think of that not being a mode of transportation. I mean, and this makes me think, and I, I don't know if you want me to switch into this subject now, but it makes me think of that little girl I was telling you about that was killed while walking to school in the early December. But one of the reasons, and that there's been mass protests all throughout the, the province uh, around schools asking for safer school infrastructure and, and safer streets for people who, uh, kids who go to school. And it's because that the, 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 um, we're pointing the finger at the fact that parents are afraid for their kids to walk to school, so they drive them, creating more chaos. So it's like an infernal cycle. And what we're, we're asking is for people to stop being afraid to let their, their kids walk to school by removing the cars so that kids feel safer to go to school. But um, like, like I said, it's all tied in, and, and, and it's an echo to the Stop the Kinder Mord movement that happened in, in Amsterdam as well. And like it's biking, walking, active mobility. It's all all these things that we just want for our kids, just to feel safe and, and to appropriate the city. Like, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and, and continue along the the thread of of talking about the rev? And I believe that there was a ghost bike that actually was removed. Can can you talk a little bit about that? And uh, first, explain what a ghost bike is, and then secondly, why would you remove it? Yeah, um, actually, ghost bikes started in the U.S. And uh, ghost bikes are installed when a cyclist has been killed by a driver of a vehicle. And the language we use is really important. I'm always trying to remind myself that uh, it's not a car that killed a cyclist. It's the driver of somebody in a car because cars are not human. And, um, and so we install ghost bikes when families allow it so that we can remember the person that, was, that died there and that the person died for no reason at all just because infrastructure was deficient. And ha had there been a separated bike path, had, had there been... Uh, I don't know, uh, extended curb curbs or whatever, anything that can make uh, somebody feel safer not in a car is what uh, a person would not have died going about their daily life that way. So that's that's why we have ghost bikes. And in Montreal and around Montreal, we have about 20 ghost bikes that we've installed. And our association has existed for 10 years. And um, But in May 2021, we removed a ghost bike along the rev because that infrastructure now means nobody, no cyclist would die the way that Mathilde Blais died uh, ha had it existed back then. And something really special about that ghost bike, it's, it's now in a museum in Quebec City. So I think just putting that in, in, in the larger perspective uh, of a museum is also very interesting. Uh, hopefully that means that we're changing our, our mindset about infrastructure and cycling and, 
and transportation. But um, yeah, so that's that's the rev. It definitely it is definitely something that makes you feel safer, unless there's cars riding in it. But um, when there's no cars in the rev, we feel very safe. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually fairly common because, I mean, it looks so inviting. Why wouldn't somebody driving a car want to go there? <laughs> and, well, in your area, it's so wide that uh, it's actually – there's some sections where it's actually wider than the street. Yeah, and, it's amazing. And, and, and the car – I can understand actually why a driver might be confused about where they're supposed to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Clarence uh, had a, a portion of his video where he you know pointed out – I think he was like, look how wide this is. So it's crazy. And, and again, here's here's uh, you know the, the the previous one is the infrastructure is getting better and da 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 and also our maintenance. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, it's got to be it's got to be both. You can't just have you just can't be done you know with building the good infrastructure. It has to be truly truly good. And but then you also have to make sure that you have the other little things like the maintenance and, and I shouldn't even call it little. I mean, th that's crucial. Uh, and, but then, you know, the additional things like bike parking and uh, the other things that support, these are all activity assets that cities can be thinking about and saying, oh, if I do these things, that helps support this culture of activity, that helps support this active mobility lifestyle. Yeah. And, and people who drive cars don't realize how much of a good idea it is for more people to be on bikes because more people on bikes means less cars if you really need your car. So it's always a win-win situation, but it's, it's hard to grasp because we're so, it is something you just have to start thinking about. So yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and here, here's a great example of an inappropriate bike parking option. <laughs> so Yeah, but those are the actual bike. That's a bike parking. Uh, it's installed that way, right, Sweet? Yeah. And, and the snow removal, like basically they're, the bikes are sort of like on the sidewalk and we actually, Montreal does do an excellent job of snow removal. And even on sidewalks, like sidewalks are often cleared prior for in priority as are the bike lanes. So like the snow removal really is the crucial element in terms of making it a viable option. Like it needs to be cleared for rush hour in the morning, basically. Like if it's not, People are not going to use it. And now there's like sort of like pedestrians are sort of complaining that, oh, the bike path is cleared, but the sidewalk's not. Or and um, which is true. Like my response is always that if that's the case, just walk in the bike path. In the in the, yeah, walk in the bike path. But it's just true because it's logical. I mean, there's more, there's less bike path than there are uh, the sidewalks. So I mean Yeah. But the bike parking is a big problem and the city removes a lot of the on-street bike parking for the winter. So parking options are fewer and fewer in the winter and they get in the way of the snow removal things. And like the, that yellow vehicle on the, on the left is what we use to sort of clear the sidewalks. And if that hits a bike, it's going to like destroy it basically. So like there's a lot of, uh, in the, and once it's destroyed, it's often still attached to the pole. So like it can fall over and get, you know, turn into a pretzel and can, you know, make even more <laughs> problem. So in this photo, there's actually two dead bikes that I can see. There's there there's a Facebook group for the for the uh, snow plow uh, plow uh, killed my bike. <laughs> I think there's a Facebook group for everything. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> shifting gears towards like the residential areas uh, and sidewalks and bike lanes through those areas, is it the same level of municipal um, government taking care of and responsibility of clearing those? Uh, the, the the snow and the ice uh, from that because uh, most North American snowy cities it's the responsibility of the landowner no here to, it's, to, it's to the, clear the snow here it's the municipal it's the borough government which actually assumes the operational responsibility but yes it is the borough that does that and some are more proactive for pedestrians and others but it's it's yeah it's not like elsewhere in North America although bike parking like the more residential area the more bike parking is a problem. Like these are poles for the, the paid parking. So the, like the, the pole exists, but in a residential neighborhood, you have, you know, street signs here and there. But other than that, there aren't a lot of bike parking options. And we do have a lot of dense neighborhoods where people don't have a garage. So in these residential areas like Gahansik, where, where um, Severine lives, there's probably not a lot of bike parking options. No, there's not enough. We have to ask, we have to uh, make an increase uh, with the, uh, uh, shop owners and everything so that they actually do install bike parking in, in front of their shops because otherwise people never know where to leave their bikes. And it's an issue. If you don't have a place to leave your bike, you're not going to use your bike. Like uh, I have an electric bike, which is 
costs more than I'd, I'd like to really think about, but I, I don't want to leave it anywhere. And uh, unless there's really secure parking, I don't, I don't leave it anywhere. So that's kind of a problem. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad that you uh, included this, uh, this particular image here, because one of the things that I think is really, really crucial for our, our urban environments is shifting away from uh, an addiction to these big box uh, delivery, package delivery situations. So cyclogistics, being able to do some bicycle uh, related e-cargo bike uh, deliveries, uh, huge. So I'm glad you included this. And there's a, a new center, the Colibri Center in Rosemont, right, Zvi? Yeah. There's a few. There's a growing number, like in my area, like you see, there's a number of competing companies, actually. This is a photo of a pirouetter. Like it's a, it's one of the big, you know, delivery agencies. So it's becoming in a lot of areas and they do work year round. Yeah. And uh, with Vélo Phantom, one of the things that we've noticed is a lot of the cyclists killed are killed by huge trucks, which are which are blind essentially because they don't have the large windows. They, they don't have the flat front. They don't have the lateral sides, uh, which would prevent uh, hitting someone. And so delivery trucks are a big problem in our city because our, our, our streets aren't that wide everywhere and there's too much parking. So um, if we could have, if we could move on to electric uh, delivery, electric car bike deliveries, that would be really, really cool. Yeah. We'd see less uh, issues like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, and, the, <laughs> and the, the, the we actually as well we have bicycle mounted police who also ride year round. So the people in the foreground there, those are actually police officers on bicycles. Yeah, and, but they they actually do. They're not dedicated to cycling issues though. They're like regular police doing regular things, but they're just getting around by bicycle, and like they don't have a specific mandate to deal with. Like this truck is actually stuck in the cycle path. <laughs> so, so um. But when, when people do block the cycle path, we're, we're told we have to call the police, which kind of, it, it seems like an inadequate use of resources, you know, that's not what the police should be doing. And, but it just, it puts people in danger when they do use the, the bike path and they park in it and they block it and whatever. But, uh, and that's an action that Vélorussion did in uh, November is, uh, and I think I put the, the, the article uh, in the list of uh, URLs uh, earlier, and they just, they blocked the bike path. It's like something a, a group did in San Francisco a few years ago saying, just give me five minutes. We'll, we'll block your car just for five minutes. It won't be long just to protect our cyclists here. So yeah. I, that, uh, speaking of another activist, uh, militant type of activity, that, that was a brilliant one that uh, made its way around on social media. So, oh, don't mind me. We're just going to block your, your mo travel, motor vehicle travel lane uh, in, until the bike path uh, gets unblocked. And here we are. You know, this, this is the key. Absolutely. It's got to be well-designed and it's got to be well-maintained, period. And this is right in front of a school as well. So this is the crossing of two of, you know, inside psychopaths uh, on two different uh, directions. And, uh, and even there, like the, the, there was actually, uh, this is a school that, in fact, it has bike psychopaths on every side and they have particular issues with too many cyclists in some ways. So which crossed like the kids getting to the school, like it's been, it's a problem with uh, the cyclists going like between the streets and the school. Yeah. Well, I, I saw recently that uh, it looks like uh, Patrick and Jasmine from uh, Oh the Urbanity uh, YouTube channel have moved back to Montreal. And you mentioned it earlier is that the urban form, the built form of Montreal is very conducive to be able to walk and bike and use uh, transit. But you also made the, the comment that it seems as if the, the municipality and the city is still trying to double down on an emphasis of making it easier to get around by car seems like those two things are very much in conflict. Well, I wouldn't say the, the, the local government is trying to do that, but they're afraid of making any waves. And it, it's like they will that do... Inconvenience. Oh, we can't possibly inconvenience the motor vehicle drivers. Well, well, it's really the parking, I would say, which is sort of like the political kryptonite. Like parking, like we do... Montreal actually has a lot of one-way streets where we make them two ways for cyclists, which is wonderful. Like there's a sort of a reverse direction cycle path. It's one way for cars and even big streets. Like there's been some pretty major streets that have been converted to one way for cars and you have a wide cycle path on each side for the cyclists. That is fine. Like that, that we're able to do. But heaven forbid you should try to take parking off of that street. 
like and and that's that's really what is causing the the biggest challenge is how to deal with coming up with other alternatives for parking well it's also because parking costs nothing in montreal and people have yeah. no idea it's just so i mean like i said i have five kids and sometimes we try to measure how what's the best way for us to go downtown and taking the metro is a fortune for our family whereas if we take our car and we just park it for two hours it's going to cost me like five dollars for all seven of us so i don't you know you have to the incentive for it to be really unfun to take your car has to be there too so uh, i really think bike parking uh, car parking is really not not uh, expensive enough and it's because it should be um all we we have we should pay for parking all the time not just from time to time but this is a really like like i like the expressions we said political kryptonite right <laughs> well if you I, it's hard to see but the my the logo in the upper right hand corner of my images is uh, community parking actually like this is a, one of my pet projects where actually particularly in neighborhoods like Severines, which is a residential neighborhood, like we need alternative options that are not on the street. And you can actually create like small mobility hubs. And like we need to create other options to reappropriate the street as public space and reallocate street space differently. You know, you have more loading zones and delivery zones. Like deliveries are a huge problem. Like the trucks don't have anywhere to park when they're you know bringing products and they all too often they block the cycle path because that's often the only option they have really. It's either the cycle path or the traffic path. So we need to we need to th- like recognize that parking is an integral part of our mobility s- ecosystem for si- parking for bicycles as well. Like it's just as important for parking a bicycle as it is parking a car. Mm-hmm. And um, it's so funny how parking, you know, comes up so frequently. Um, one of my all time favorite episodes that I've produced is is with Don Shoup, the you know author of the, the High Cost of Free Parking and. And, and we joke about that. It's just like, it's so integral to everything. And as you mentioned, Zave, it's, it's like this, it's this political kryptonite that's there. Uh, but a couple of weeks ago, I mean, the big news was, you know, Amsterdam opening another 7,000 spot parking garage for bikes, <laughs> you know, and, and very, very convenient, very, very beautiful. And really trying to make it easy and comfortable and safe and welcoming for people to be able to uh, use their bike to get to transit and then go on to their their ultimate destination. So incredibly important. But I I would add an even more important thing that Amsterdam is doing as well is they're systematically removing on-street parking. Like, yes, they added 7,000 bike parking, but they remove every single year, like close to 2,000 on-street parking places. Yeah, and I think they, they're on on route to for their most recent initiative. They're trying to remove twelve thousand, I believe. So yeah, yeah. We're not close to that here. <laughs> We're not close to that. I mean, we should, you know, maybe another since Montreal is an island, maybe another way for for it to be harder to park would be to maybe have tolls on our bridges. I know that's another uh, hard decision, but there, we have to start thinking about limiting the number of cars we have in our city because recent reports have shown. How much, what I, I, I won't even try to get into the numbers, but the number of cars every year that we add onto our streets is just incredible. And they're larger too. So, I mean, like you said, if we remove the parking, maybe people will think, hey, that's complicated. Maybe I should get rid of my car because it's just, a, it's a nuisance. So, but. Yeah. Severine, I'm going to have you speak to, to this particular slide uh, as a parent of five. Um, and one of the things that I find most encouraging about the the Dutch uh, system, the experience that they have, they've built at this point, and in large part also what we're seeing in Copenhagen and several other critical cities where it's truly, truly safe and inviting for, for kids to be able to get around. Again, Olu Fenlin, a great example, is the fact that kids can then become free range kids. They have that ability because you're able to encourage that next generation. They're embraced, they're inspired, they can be able to do that. Speak a little bit to that from, from your perspective as a parent. Well, I actually have one of my, my children goes to school uh, seven kilometers from our house and he goes by bike and he actually really hates it when we take the car now. And because it gives him the freedom, he knows the city better than any of my other kids. He knows how to get anywhere. He's he's confident. And he started doing this when he was 11. So, I mean, this is something I, I didn't have that confidence when I was his age. I took the metro, but I didn't know much else about traveling around the city. He knows how to avoid 
conflicts. He, he knows how to deal with intersections. He knows exactly how to time his lights to know what speed he should ride. These are all just fun things to, to know and learn when you're riding a bike. And it just, it, it is freedom. And he, when I, we talk about when they get adults and they, they never, none of them want to have their driver's license because they don't see the point. They're like, we, we know how to get around. We have a bike. That's all we need. We can walk, we can run, we can do these things. And I think that's great. You know, we talk about the fact that kids don't move around and aren't active enough. What's easier than riding your bike to go somewhere? I mean, you're two, two, two birds in one stone. So uh, I love that my kids feel confident on the secure bike pass to go. I'm always a bit nervous when they choose to go in the street and not use the circular bike bike pass, but um, that's because of Vélo Fantôme. You know, I, I, I see the other side, but uh, on secure bike pass, I mean, I go. They, 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 I'm really secure that they, they're comfortable and, uh, and safe on them. And I know uh, for the Dutch children, it's right around 11 or 12 where they actually have sort of their proficiency exams of being able to demonstrate that they can get around the city uh, on their own uh, on bike. Just amazing. And we have, a, we have a similar program here called Cycliste Averti, which is also with Vélo Québec. And uh, schools choose to have the program. And then you have teachers that come in and uh, they teach uh, fifth and fourth and fifth graders how to uh, know the road rules when you're on a bike, how to cross uh, securely, how to, how to ride your bike. And some of them learn and they, they get uh, loaned bikes to do that. And then it encourages their, their parents, hey, m- mom and dad, can you come and take me on the bike path? So it's all a, it's all a real integrated system. It's a great, great program. Yeah. Zebby, um, for your final word, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this experience that you've seen uh, over the decades or over the years uh, there in Montreal and, you know, the, 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 this transformation and the, this ability to keep pedaling through these obstacles. Well, I mean, one of the things that's interesting is a lot of kids, small kids do like to ride to school. And um, in, Mon- in in Quebec, like our school system is primary school and secondary school. There's no middle level. And usually the secondary schools are bigger and farther away. So there's a steep drop off in terms of active transportation to schools. And my daughter as well, um, because of COVID actually. So so a lot of kids, they they discover public transportation. That sort of becomes their, their opening to uh, discover a new world. And they like literally from the age of 11 or 12, they start going everywhere by public transportation on their own. Because of COVID, my daughter actually uh, returned to cycling. Like she cycled a lot when she was little and she returned to cycling. And basically she now appreciates it like me. Like it's just practical for her things. Like her boyfriend lives like 20 kilometers away from us. And like they ride their bikes to like see one another. And she rides to college every day now. And she she has ridden in the snow like uh, uh, quite a bit. And like she's uh, like... She, I guess you could, she's on the verge of becoming a winter cyclist. So, so, um, but she has like ridden, um, yeah, like her friends were actually surprised that she, 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 did, she didn't show up by bike. <laughs> like, but in this photo is like, you see a lot of young kids who like really want to ride. And in this particular case, the car is actually parked to, to, into the bike path. So this bike path, normally the snow is better cleared. But in this one section, because the cars were, didn't leave enough space, they weren't able to clear the snow. So the father is actually literally like pushing, like pedaling, helping his son to pedal through the, through the, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you see, like, you see a lot of little kids though who want to ride bikes and I think this is a good metaphor. You know, it's, you know, there's still, it's not a direct path to improvement. Like things are definitely getting better, but there are still obstacles along the way. And like, we need to, you know, keep pedaling through them to really transform the way people uh, appreciate moving in the city. Well said, well said. Severin, for you, uh, for your final word, um, I, I'd like you to address two things, actually. Uh, one is, uh, Zevi just mentioned, you know, his daughter continuing to ride or, you know, picking up riding again and riding into into her teens, into college. Uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that I see in cities globally, uh, except for the Netherlands, is that the dr- the ridership levels of uh, girls really drops off once they get into their teen years. I'd love to have you sort of uh, address that from your perspective. And then finally, uh, anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure we leave the audience with? Well, from what in, in regards to the teen ridership, I, I unfortunately all my 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 kids are boys, and except for my last one, 
which is uh, my only girl. But um, I, I just I find I don't I don't see why they would stop riding their bikes now now that they've learned. And I, I think if if I had a girl, it's the same thing. Like like Z said, it's convenience and it's the fact that everything's so um, safe and secure and and well well equipped. And the more bike lanes we have, the more secure bike lanes we have, and the more room we take away from cars, which narrow the streets and 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 helps cars reduce their speed, makes it safer for everyone. So I think uh, teen ridership should be on the up if, as long as they start riding when they're kids. Uh, but other than that, I just, I'm, I'm amazed that there is a, a bike culture in our city. That's true. If, if you look at all the events all year round that take place that, that can form into a, a young people's minds into the fact that but riding a bike is a possibility here and it's a choice that you have now have. And I'm not sure I had that 20, 30 years ago when, when I moved back to Quebec, but if I was growing up now, I think you totally do see why not ride a bike? I mean, it's it's one of the most viable options, and there's so many things fun associated with it, with the with the critical mass, with the with all the types of bike rides in your barrows and everything, and, and other biking related events. So, uh, and I think we're pretty lucky. I, like, like you said, you have to see the positive about it. And Montreal is on is up and coming, and, and going to keep going uh, through its obstacles and uh, and finding better ways to to pedal. Yeah. Yeah. I want to uh, give you a, a, a quick uh, moment to talk about uh, two organizations uh, that you sent my way. So, so this particular group. This is in my neighborhood. So this is my, my husband's spokesperson for this one. And we just we started this about 10 years ago and it was our neighborhood uh, active mobility group. And it's been so popular that a second group has uh, has been born in our neighborhood as well. So we're a very active mobility uh, neighborhood. <laughs> And uh, but we're, we're the furthest away from the downtown. We're 10 kilometers out, but we're starting to get bike paths. And what's really cool is there's a, a neighboring uh, group, which is in Montréal now, and they've followed us and they're trying to follow our lead uh, and asking us how they, how we we might, we. Uh, we were able to mobilize and get bike pass. And after 40 years of not getting bike pass, they're starting, they're getting their bike pass this year as well. So, um, so that's, that's fun with NSIC. We, we just try to gather people and do a, a we survey a news and, and fun bike stuff around the world. And Velo Fantôme obviously is what I'm, uh, one of the groups I'm the spokesperson for. And, um, we, our goal is to not exist. Is that's our motto? We, we we don't want to exist anymore. We do exist, and we're there for families and for cyclists and for the community. And it's important to remember cyclists that have died. But it's it's just so heartbreaking every time we do install a bike. And um, actually, this year we installed a plaque for a woman who was killed 40 years ago, and her best friend contacted us because she was still so heartbroken about the fact that her her friend had died, and she wanted to remember her in in this way. So we did install a plaque for her. And um, so there, there is, um, it, it's a very important group and I think it, it does uh, reach people, but it's incredibly sad. And I just hope we don't exist sometimes and that we'll just be in the museum soon. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. All right. Zevi, final, final word from you, sir. I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, a, a growing number of smaller cities in Quebec are actually starting to be perhaps more progressive than Montreal. Okay, I think uh, I think in Montreal, it, in in some ways, I think the city now is doing too much consultation, and I think the city, mm. like we understand enough what needs to be done, and and they should just do it. Like they don't need to every single time that they like there. There's a a psychopath very very near our house that it was rolled out literally in two weeks during COVID as a sort of temporary solution, and it was unbelievably successful. And like everyone was like really shocked and they had like, it was like very perverse. They had to take it away because it was provincial funding for COVID. And if they left it in place, the city would have to pay for it. So they had to take it away because they didn't want to pay. They didn't want to whatever spend it. So anyway, they're bringing it back now, but they've sort of reopened the consultation once again. Well, not really. It's, Not it's, really. No, it is coming yeah. back, but like a lot of people are are. I I went to the consultation, and a lot of people are very mad because, yes, the city is saying it's coming back, and we're only just talking to you for details. So so like people are very like some people are are upset about this. I I think that there's a really really good thing to say. You you made two very very important points. Is that uh, smaller communities can be more nimble. They can actually move you know quicker oftentimes because they may not have the same level of, of bureaucracy that's there. The other thing that's very, very important about what you said is that at some point in time, do we really have to have endless 
consultations and open houses and meetings. And I don't know the right answer to that because every single, every single community, every single city, every single country, you know, has a different kind of culture to this. Uh, we were talking a little bit about Mayor Hildalgo in, in the things that she's doing in Paris. And she's basically like, this is my mandate. This is what I'm doing. This is the leadership. This is what I'm doing. If you got a problem with that, tough, you'll adapt. We have to do this. This is in, sort of and like we have to do it with a sense of urgency. Here. But that's not necessarily going to fly in in every in every you know location. I know here in, in Austin, Texas. I mean, literally every single project, every single street has to have that continual communication. And I get it on both sides. I get it on on the desire to be able to want to move you know, quicker with a sense of urgency. But I also get the sense that in our democracies, we have this uh, sense, we don't want to feel like we're losing our sense of agency of what's happening to us, because if they, if we have that kind of feel like it's happening to us. So I, I don't, I don't have the right answer there. I'm just kind of like acknowledging you just brought that up and it's so it's relevant. Like someone said, you, you don't have that many consultations to build sidewalks. Why should you have consultations to build bike paths? You know, or, or more importantly, you know, let's get get out of the active transportation realm because here in Austin, we do have that many meetings about building sidewalks, but we don't have that many meetings about building an additional car lane. Right. Craziness. Thank you both so very much. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure, and I can't wait to get back up there. Uh, my last visit was uh, 2018, uh, and it was for the summertime uh, celebration events that uh, Velo Quebec uh, does, the Tour de l'Ile and, and Tour de, de, Tour de la, la Nuit and Tour de l'Ile. Uh, absolutely, you know, two fun uh, celebration activities of the bicycle in the summertime, but I do need to get up there in the wintertime and check out some of your fun events. Events. Again, thank you so very much uh, to you both. Thank you, John. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with me and Severine. And if you did, please remember, give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe here to the Active Towns channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it so you can customize your notification preferences for all the new content coming your way. Uh, and again, I, I really appreciate you tuning in. It means so much to me. And also, if you are enjoying this channel and getting some value out of this content that I'm creating, uh, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador and supporting me out on uh, Patreon, uh, buy me a coffee, <laughs> or even making donations to the nonprofit. Uh, the links are down below in the video description and in the show notes. I really do appreciate any and all support that you're able to provide. It helps keep me going. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>